Hi, welcome to Primal Perspective from the Primal Lab. My name is Ben Sanford and I'll be your guide today. So here at the Primal Lab, we try to look at things from um, as many perspectives as possible and penetrate deeply to the core and essence of things where we reveal the principles, processes, and patterns of nature. And uh, at this time of month, our focus is on what's called the path and, or what we call the path and the nature of choice and it has to do with our, it's part of our training series. So uh, you'll learn a lot more about that as we get into today. So I'm excited that my, one of my best buddies, Christopher Harley, is uh, joining us today, who always brings a powerful and unique perspective to any conversation. And so we have a lot of fun with that. Um, so look forward to sharing more about the path with you. And uh, thanks for, thanks for joining. Hey there, I am here with my best buddy, Christopher Harley, also known as Harley, also known as Chris, uh, the one and only. So uh, today, really excited to have him with us, and um, who knows what we're going to be talking about, really. We get into talking with Harley, and it all becomes one thing anyway. So, uh, But I'm really looking forward to this. We have tons of uh, deep chats on our own, and um, the focus of our conversation and our theme in our training right now is uh, a class called The Path. And um, really what that's looking at is the journey of training and learning. And um, this, uh, I guess, the experience of, uh, well, we'll get into it a little more, but the, uh, the power of, of choice essentially is what it's gonna be. So um, again, who knows what we'll get into together but um that is where we're starting where we're jumping off from so thanks for being here harley and uh really excited to have you my absolute pleasure thank you very much appreciate it right on so um you know usually i start with some sort of uh explaining what primal perspective means because that is our um frame of reference and uh you know you kind of already know what that means so i don't really have to do that for you but for anyone watching you know our approach here is to look at subjects and and these conversations and um try to uh reveal the what we refer to as like the principles and processes behind things and get down to the core of things and that's really what i mean by prime so um and by perspective i think we'll learn a little bit more about what that means i think that might come up here in our talk. So um, Harley is uh, someone who's been, I don't know, he's got a lot of different uh, backgrounds in a way and um, eclectic a lot of pursuits. Connection. <laughs> What's that? Eclectic <laughs> pursuits. He's an eclectic uh, polymath nearly. Uh, big, yeah. So you, know, you, you have to actually have degrees and stuff to be considered that. I don't, yeah. I don't have that level. I'm more just, uh, uh, it's all one thing. So I'm just, approaching the one thing in lots of ways. Yeah. So, so we'll be, you know, probably touching on some uh, tracking. That's another kind of area that we're focusing on in the season. Uh, and Harley has a lot of experience in that area. Uh, martial arts, of course, always comes up and uh, learning in general. But um, so anyway, let's just see where this goes. Awesome. Um, let me ask you in terms of you know, what I'm referring to as the path, maybe we could first define that. What, what do you think of when it comes to um, what is training <laughs> and what is, uh, you know, I'm just gonna say this phrase that comes up for us a lot of time, often, which is uh, freedom or power through constraints. And, and so I'm kind of curious on, I always like to hear what you have to say about training and just what that means. Um, as well as the freedom through constraints concept. So, um, yeah, um, I'll try to talk about that a little bit. I'd actually kind of like to circle back a little bit as well and, and talk about 
the path and and the okay. perspective. Yes. Cool. Start there. That sounds great. Okay. Um, so to me, uh, in in my experience, people view things like the the idea of the path or the idea of the way. Um, and those are, I think, distinct things. Uh, the way is how you walk and the path is sort of where. Um, but there, there's a gray area between them. You know, um, how you walk the path does determine how, how you make a path. Um, so for a lot of people, they think of the path as like this thing laid out in front that they will follow. Um, and that can be, but the only thing definitively that I know is the path is what I have done. Um, that's the path that has been made and I can see other people's paths and what they have made. And then there are, <laughs> suddenly I'm getting texts that <laughs> I hope that's not coming through with things. Um, all day, nothing. Anyway. Um, so you, you can only really know what has been done. And so you can, uh, some people really clear a path for others um, in, a, in a distinct way. So we would look at uh, people that, that we look to for and call masters of things. Um, or many generations have put together, uh, you know, experienced learning, passing it on, that, that clears a path. Um, but at a certain point, you're going to meander because of your own needs, because of your, where, how you're seeing the world, what your perspective is at the time, um, what's drawing your attention. Um, and all of that is, is, is encompassed in it. And then when you think about the, the what is ahead and looking at your path, um, for some, that can be very clear um, because they whatever the circumstances of their life are, uh, they, to, it's going to be really useful if we just keep coming back to actual physical representations, right? A path is a thing. So we can think about it. So if you think of a path in a, it, that, that meanders through, um, grassy hillsides, you're going to see it pretty clearly most of the way, right? Um, even if you're not entirely sure of exactly where the path goes, you know, yourself, you know, like, well, I don't, I'm not the kind of person that, that just eases along and stays on one topography, one, one topographical level. Um, I'm, you know, maybe I'm a, I like the ups and downs. So you're going to see the ways up and down on the hillside or on a mountain or, or something like that. Um, or maybe you're really drawn to water. So you're just always going to go to where, you know, streams or lakes or, uh, coastlines are. Um, and those are, those are important it, it, for understanding your own path, but you have to understand those things about yourself for that to be clear. For some people, their path is going to be really difficult to see in any kind of, uh, with any kind of distance, any kind of further into time, because it's going to meander through jungle and mountain and desert. And I mean, it's just going to go through so many terrains that you can't even know you're going to get to. Um, you know, maybe the jungle you're in right now is so dense, you can't, you really can't see, you know, 50 yards, let alone, and if we called 50 yards, you know, I don't know, two months into your own future or something like that. Um, but that's not a bad thing. It, it, you know, the important thing is being able to see the steps in front of you. And unless you're in a blizzard, in a whiteout, and you are just there's no bearings whatsoever. The wind's shifting constantly and everything like that. You literally can't even see the tracks you're leaving behind and you don't know the ground you're stepping on in front of you. Um, you know, it's probably a good idea to just sit for a while, <laughs> let the storm pass <laughs> um, and, and understand the risks and stuff. And that's, that's as concrete of an analogy as I can make when talking about things like a path that there's, what people have laid out and done before, which every one of us is doing to some degree or another. If no one else follows, then the path kind of gets uh, absorbed back into to the everything else going on. Um, but if enough people are following, then then hey, you've you've cleared a little bit of space. Um, That's for, really cool. 
easier movement. Um, and there are people that it's important to them that that's what they do for other people, right? That they, it's important to them that they are clearing paths. They're removing obstacles. Um, you know, uh, civil rights activists, right? I mean, most of their job is to run right into the heaviest obstacles and remove them to whatever degree they can. Um, so their path is the obstacles, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that other people don't have to spend the time and effort um, dealing with those things so that they can be more involved in their environment than just what's right in front of them. Um, whereas other people, you know, it, it, it's, it's not about that. It's, it's about doing their own thing and, and maybe they can't even trace back their own path because it's so eclectic and meandering and what have you. Um, so that, that's, that's sort of how I think about the path or paths uh, on a, from a using it as a tool for understanding and learning and so forth. Um, but getting back to what you asked specifically. Um, Actually, there, let, me, let me ask you another question first. Sure. Let me interrupt you with this one. What's the, uh, so people have a sense of, a little bit more sense of who you are and what your background is with paths after that definition. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, if they don't know you and they don't know what, all that you have to share, what, what's, what's your, how is this relevant to you? Um, so I'm, I'm an unusual person in that, um, I have, I have literally been just a little bit off as long as anyone who knows me can remember and as long as I can remember, um, not in a, you know, not in a, uh, I'm not contrarian innately, but I do have aspects of that in my, in my nature. Um, but that plus an incredibly supportive family life has allowed me to be incredibly lucky to explore a lot, um, and, and really take a lot of risks that other people just don't have the opportunity to do, um, because I have more of a safety net or, or more support than, than a sane person <laughs> would probably get into. So, um, so my family's always been, Hey, if you're into it, go for it check it out. They also have not really been like, you have to finish what you start. It's just not, it's not how I was raised on things. I did have to achieve things. I, if I had started something and there was something like, let's say, you know, I took tap dancing because I wanted to do something dance wise. I like dance. Um, and tap seemed the least, uh, I'll be honest, like, it, it, it seemed like it was a perfectly masculine way of dancing, right? <laughs> I was like, I want to learn to dance. I like dancing. Uh, what's the way that's kind of cool? And, uh, and, and, you know, oh, Gregory Hines, he's pretty dope. Uh, yeah, I want to do that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but so there, in taking that, there was a performance at the end of that class. Um, and so I was expected to finish the class. I was not expected to continue tap dancing once that was done, right? So similar to um, if uh, it, you know, I, I, I took clarinet very, very briefly in junior high, junior high, early high school. I can't remember. Um, and I was horrible and I was undisciplined and, and um, but I was expected to at least finish out what the chunk of the lessons were. You know, it was a few months. It's like three months or whatever straight of class. So, um, and I also don't come from a family that really stressed, you have to be great at it. Um, and which is weird because, you know, if you look at some of the people in my family, they, they want to be great at whatever they try. Um, I haven't necessarily wanted to be great at whatever I try. I <laughs> want to do it. And if I maintain an interest, then I want to keep doing it. And so all of that is just sort of the groundwork for, and then, <laughs> um, so I, I was never great in, in school for quite a long time. I found it to be tedious and annoying. And uh, people said I had problems with authority. My response was, 
I have, I don't have any problem with authority. I just have to actually meet them. And <laughs> just because you're, you're the person standing in front of the classroom does not mean that. Um, and that caused its own problems. So initially a lot of what I was learning in my path, as I look back and I track it was a lot of how not to do things. Um, a lot of how to make better use of what was driving me and what I valued in a way that didn't get in my own way and didn't, you know, sort of a pick your battles kind of thing. Um, so I went from being a pretty horrible student to being someone that, that good teachers kind of valued having in the class, not necessarily because I was stellar, but just because I was engaged and I was interested because I, I could be and I wanted to be. So that brings it, I'll just jump to college because that's an area where people can do that. They can, um, so, and for example, my family, like I had wanted to be a stuntman since I was six years old. Well, first I wanted to be bionic um, because I was super into the $6 million man. It was my favorite show. And then I found out that it around that same age, I, re I found out that television wasn't real. And then I found out that Lee Majors had done some stunt work, um, you know, sort of the, the, early mythos of him was that, that he had done stunt work before he became an actor. And I, I found out later that that wasn't as much as I thought it was, but um, anyway, I ended up becoming bionic because I have a pacemaker, um, but I, I had my, my set sight set since six years old on being a stuntman. And I made steps and did things to, to move that direction. But my parents had a deal. They were like, look, you have to, you have to get an undergrad degree. It's just you have to because especially at that time it's not so much the case now it's almost not the case now but it was like look if you hurt yourself if anything goes wrong you have that and you can you can get a solid job mm -hmm. um which was another way of saying you can do a thing that you know you'll hate doing um, and so i in college you know i went because that was the deal um but I was fortunate enough to go to a university that actually I could take trampoline for credit. Dude. So that was pretty dope. Um, and very quickly, uh, by the end of my freshman year, uh, when I took my first trampoline class, um, when I came back in the fall, in the fall of the sophomore year, um, I was already an assistant for the class. Uh, I was assisting and taking trampoline classes three hours a day, uh, three times a week. Um, that teacher also taught springboard diving. So I started doing that because I was like, hey, acrobatics, this is going to be great for stunt work. Um, and all of that's still the thing. I was like, I am doing this. And as soon as college is over, I'm going to LA. I'm becoming a stuntman. I had contacts. Um, people were, you know, just through phone conversations and, and meeting one time, this kid, they were like, hey, we're going to hook you up. Um, and that was the deal. That was, that was where I was headed. And I got a chance to try out for Cirque du Soleil, which at the time was you had to be invited. I only got invited because my teacher was helping them out with planning two new shows. So she said, hey, part of the compensation is you give, you give a few of my folks a shot. Um, but I got to do it. And it was, and it was, really cool to kind of train for it a little bit and, and have the experience all the while, um, jumping back to, to high school, um, the being not a great student meant that at a certain point, the school I've been going to my whole life, um, up through seventh grade said, you really need to actually not just get C's. It's not okay. To which I said, but C's are the minimum that you guys require for enrollment. They're like, yeah, we're kind of lying about that. You need to do better. So the suggestion was made that I go to a boarding school and, and that would give me the structure I needed and, and stuff. Um, and I did that and I'd never been much, again, not great with school, didn't really dig it and not much of a reader. Boarding school, you got a lot of time to do a whole lot of nothing. Um, and I started reading, my sister sent me um, the tracker by Tom Brown Jr. And immediately I was like, this is amazing. This is so cool. She's like, well, there's other books. And she sent me the search. And I read through that. And at the back of that one, it had 
a, an ad for his school. You could actually, I was like, wait, you can go to a place <laughs> and learn this? Yeah, I remember that moment. <laughs> for me. Well, I'm in. <laughs> um, and again, going back to the support of family, I mean, I was the kid that I was just essentially not home in the summer. Um, maybe a few weeks uh, here and there, you know, had family time and stuff. But in general, I was off to summer camp. I was off to something. Um, and at the time, you needed to be 18. And I was in eighth grade, so not there. And uh, wrote him a letter and said, I really want to come. I really want to learn this. I know I have to be 18, but I promise I won't make fools out of you if you let me come. I'm, I'm, and my parents wrote a letter to go along with it saying, he, 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 he'll be good. <laughs> He's, he knows how to behave away from home. Um, so uh, not that year, but the next summer, um, a spot was open. And one of the helpers at that class was going to bring his son, who was about my age. And they said, yeah, you're in. And so 15 years old, I'm introduced to Tracker, and I've just been doing it ever since in different ways. Um, and so jumping up to back to college, and I'm doing all this acrobatics, and that's all going on, and school's about to be over. I'm going to have a big chunk of time before I'm going to move to LA, and I'm like, hey, there are these tractor classes that I've wanted to do for years. I'd only gotten to do, do the back-to-back -back since my standard um, in 90. In 90. Um, so I was all jazzed up. I'm like, I'm going to do this. You know, things had come up. Um, I'd gotten sick at one time, one time, and so I couldn't do the class. Then there was another point where they canceled the class um, or rescheduled it to a week later, and it didn't work anymore because I'd already scheduled stuff during that time. Um, so finally I was like, I can do this. It's going to happen. So that was 99 and, uh, went, I had torn two ligaments in my ankle on the trampoline, uh, five and a half weeks before the class was supposed to start. Um, they told me it was going to take me six or seven weeks to rehab. And I was like, I don't care what has to happen. I'm going to this thing. It's been too long. And that's when I met, that's not when I met you. I met you in 97 uh at um really? philosophy um but i finally went after school was over so i'm like all right let's do this it's great and then i did another class and then i did another class and then i did another class and next thing i know it's uh, it's into 2000 and i've done like seven classes since june <laughs> or something like that and it's you know february or so and i was like okay um i don't think i'm gonna be a stuntman anymore uh everything i was interested in led me here but i think i'm gonna go my family had some property in tahoe i was like i think i'm gonna go to tahoe and i'm gonna track because the experience i had at tracker school with all those classes um some of them very physical, some of them very, what people would call spiritual or philosophical, um, and everything in between. I just, something clicked for me and I went, stunt work doesn't help anybody. Mm. It, 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 it'll be fun. I'll probably hurt myself a lot. Um, I'll definitely be beating myself up and I'll get to do cool stuff. And I'm a huge movie buff. I'll get to be in movies. That'll be great, but it doesn't help anybody. And that, for the first time really mattered to me. And so I moved to Tahoe and I spent my days tracking and, and my nights bouncing because um, I figured that was the best job I could get to practice awareness and, and dealing with people and, and trying to be helpful. Um, kind of a challenge because when people aren't at their best, it's kind of hard to help them, um, especially when they don't want help. Um, so, that's just a little bit, you know, and, and then through Tracker, I also got into, I'd always been interested in martial art. I'd, I'd done a very little bit of, of uh, a lot of different things. The longest stretch was probably boxing for, I don't know, like six months or something like that. Um, but nothing had ever really clicked for me. And then at Tracker, I was exposed to the Kali JKD stuff. And I was like, this is what I've always been wanting. This is what I was looking for the whole time. Um, so got super into that and, 
I basically started doing, I kept taking tracker classes, um, kept tracking daily. Um, I had a square mile across the street from where I lived that I could just explore and, and really kind of map out and figure out what was going on where through all the seasons. Um, I had my sit spot twice a day. I, uh, I dove into the lake every morning and swam back to shore, you know, uh, at sunrise kind of thing. Um, and kept doing seminars, uh, for martial art, kept doing seminars for tracking or for tracker, uh, helping a lot at classes. Cause I knew how much I would get out of, out of being able to convey back to people what I thought I understood and, and learning from their learning progression. Um, and I kept doing that. And the next thing I know, I'm just sort of turning around and looking at, at what I have done over time and what I'm interested in. And I sort of realized, well, it's always been pretty much the same thing. Um, at first it was a self-reliance thing that became a, once a certain confidence came with that, it became a helping other people thing movement always being crucial in there and, um, and play and having fun, you know, with whatever was going on. Um, I did a vision quest, uh, over September 11th, 2001. That was a, you want to have an interesting experience, go into the woods completely alone for four days and come out and have the, the news that people flew planes into buildings and wow, that'll change. Um, so I just, I guess the, the sort of short version of what I do is I keep doing, it's not just follow your passion. I'm passionate about lots of things, but follow what always sort of just, it just felt right and felt like a heading. I was, I, I, my path has been a path of a new heading, right? So I'm still, if we, if we take it from path and take it to just navigation, like I'm still on the same boat and the boat has been repaired and changed over time, but it's essentially the same boat. It's just taken different tacks at times. And I'm generally heading north at times or generally heading east at times, but I'm always on the ocean. So it's always felt like I was always doing the same thing and everything seemed to always blend together. Um, you know, after I lived in Tahoe, I, I moved to LA and I worked as a body worker and that it just fit with the acrobatics and the tracking perfectly. Um, and it helped people. And it was interesting because I was always learning all the time. And people were paying me to follow my curiosity. And that's where I am now. People are paying me to follow my curiosity with teaching martial art or, or, um, or anything else. So yeah, I hope any of that made sense. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's a, it's a cool, um, I really like how you, you wove in, uh, your path is what's behind you. And so that gives us kind of a good sense of, you know, your past actually um so and i'm I, yeah it was cool to be in there about i showed up in your path about what 20 years ago yeah just, i mean well um, 97 before. i think it was 97 in in california right at the the yeah. field two sure enough or phil yeah. one phil one yeah so uh pretty amazing um well and well coming back to that it was very interesting because you shared with me what you were seeing as a path that you could create and and you weren't sharing that with a lot of people and i was like that's awesome totally do that and i remember you asking like well but so how do you and i was like i really have no idea how to do that because that's not how i work i just don't <laughs> i don't know how to make a plan like that because because yeah i don't i mean i i'm uh and the funny thing is I was always much more, you know, eh, I'm making this up as I go. And now more and more, especially in the last, you know, five, 10 years, getting more, okay, I've done that. And now I, through that, I have some ideas of how to make those plans and mm -hmm. how to achieve certain goals and, and be realistic about timeframes and stuff. Um, and I've watched you kind of go from have the plan, make the plan, enact the plan to all right here's a general framework and and 
you know, we'll we'll play on the fl- it, It's been really cool to kind of be like, we're interested in the same thing and we're just sort of doing this. <laughs> just, you know. So that's been on my end, uh, really useful and inspiring to see other people walking their path the way they do and, and being like, oh, that's cool. And ooh, that actually would fit me. Cool. You know, mm-hmm. or even better, um, you know, we'll go back to the martial art briefly. Uh, I was training at the Inosano Academy because I, I just want, I wanted to since I was introduced to the Kali Silat stuff. Um, I end up in classes with uh, Sifu Larry Hartzell and he's like, hey, do you want to do these semi-private classes? I was like, absolutely. Two more hours with you? <laughs> of course. And he's like, okay, cool. Just join this association. And, and it's this much a year. I think it was like 40 bucks or something like that, or 70 bucks a year. And I was like, okay. I didn't put two and two together that that was an, in, the ins, an instructor association. I was placed on a path toward in, becoming an instructor. So that's another thing about paths. Some people can just put you there. <laughs> or be like, or you're walking and they go, cool. Ain't. And you're like, yeah, I'm just, di, 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 di. I'm just going to keep going. Um, and he's one of two that have done that to me. Um, cut to four years down the line and I'm an instructor under him. Um, uh, soon after that, I'm an instructor under uh, Guru Inasano, only because before Sifu Larry died, he basically said like, you need to get your instructorship. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Um, who else should I train with? And he rattled off some names. I'm like, great, cool, I'll do that. They were all people I was gonna do that with anyway. Um, cut to, I'm in Atlanta and I'm training with Sifu Francis Fong and, and had no intention of seeking any kind of instructorship under him. Next thing you know, he's handing me a certificate being like, okay, you're an apprentice instructor now. And I'm like, okay. And he absolutely knew me, knew my psychology because basically I went from I'll play with this and it'll be fun to now I have a responsibility. <laughs> you mother, <laughs> fine, all right, I guess I'll do it. You know, and dove in and and um. Anyway, so that led to being in a teacher role. The kid who had been a nightmare for what I consider to be not great teachers. I, was not a, I don't think I was a nightmare for good teachers, but um, is now a teacher and in that role and starting to apply, oh, here's a whole lot of what not to do. Cool. Got that handled. Uh, but now I have to start drawing from other people because I've only paid attention up to this point what works for me. And now where I'm at is I am really interested in studying how other people teach and learn so that I can pull from that and be like, yeah, here you go. And they go like, oh, that's really cool. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't work for me, by the way. I can't do that at all. <laughs> but I've seen it work for people like you. So here, boom, that's for you, you know? Um, and that's sort of the job. Uh, I'm, as usual, I'm taking a very circuitous path around the conversation. So. Hey man, the art, of, the art of wandering, as you were talking about. Yeah. Um, no, and I would also bring up, I think it's important because people can make things like a path or a way or, um, or really any pursuit or any philosophy really serious. And the truth of the matter is, I don't care who you are. I mean, take for example, Guru Dan and Asano, right? The guy has trained in more martial arts than most people could ever get a chance to. He's forgotten more about martial art than, than most people would ever learn in a lifetime. Um, he's always learning and he's always exploring. He's still wandering. Something will come up and art will come up and he'll be like, you know, he, when he was turning 70, he's like, oh, I need to do a little something for fitness and, and, and getting some of my mobility back. It's not feeling good. Oh, I know, capoeira. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, but that comes from that, like, he will explore anywhere. And, and, he, and people could look at him as, like, the most serious martial art accomplishment a person could get. 
um, in terms of time and reps and, and accolades and what have you. Um, but at the end of the day, he's just a wanderer. Literally, I mean, other than, you know, during this, this time of, of restricted travel and things like that, I mean, every weekend of the 50, 48, at least, weekends of, of the year, he's traveling. Wow. Going around being with different people, doing like, oh, yeah, he's, he's doing martial art, but, like, but it's all different. And none of us are different than that. You know, if he's, if, if he's someone that people would consider something to shoot for and they're taking it really seriously, they would be doing themselves a disservice to not maintain that as seriously as you're taking it, you're still just wandering. You're still just exploring. Um, and that's what's great. That's actually why it's cool. That's actually why it's fulfilling. Um, I don't, I wouldn't even say just, wandering is a primal skill. I would put it that way, that it's Agreed. not just, it's, it's essential. Yep. Definitely. That's a whole topic right there on the way of wandering. Um, yeah. So what do you, okay. So now we have a sense of, you know, your path and your experience and also what path is. I kind of want to, I'm looking at both as the noun and the verb, you know, not path, I guess, training, you know, so there's, there's kind of the way of training, but there's also the, the process, like the, uh, you can train something, you can guide something. I actually just discovered that the root word of training and um, trail, both go back to the same word in Latin, it's to pull. Ah. Isn't that awesome? That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. So to yeah. me, thinking yeah. back to the uh, the heading, right? That right. attention is drawing you towards the vision. Yeah. You know, that pull. So as a teacher or a guide or as a, I mean, it's just, it's so powerful to pushing people's hard. I mean, you can push them here and there, but to pull people, you know, in terms of that down the path. But anyway, so um, just kind of want to go back to, I guess, the first question I asked about your take on, uh, okay, well, let's, let's just assume that some people listening may not have uh, the comfort in wandering that, or the experience in wandering that you do, um, or feel lost in some way or don't feel like they're on a path. I hear that a lot, which is just kind of like, well, did you look behind you? Yeah. <laughs> you are, you know, but. Uh, yeah, it, 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 I love people <laughs> who say, well, I began my spiritual journey at 17. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> nope. That, the fact that you just said that means there's something about, not everything, obviously, but there's something about your understanding of what spiritual path is <laughs> that the fact that you would even say that means you're missing something. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 so we're so all yeah. yeah. Let's just go with um, maybe, you know, some people need more structure or some people are afraid of structure. Um, you know what I'm getting at is basically right. what is one of the key concepts, principles that you would say goes into the art of wandering? I'm just going to start calling it that, you know, in the way that we're talking about it as uh, just discovering path, you know, you know, um, also, you know, I want to, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I want to frame path as it's like this universal process that's present in everything from a neural pathway, you know, like a mm -hmm. learning a new emotion or even a thought or a behavior to, as mentioned, like trails on the, <clears throat> trails on the landscape or patterns that you can see, um, right. but also into the, uh, uh, like the traditional models of, you know, pathways of how to, you know, a martial arts system is a traditional model or path or, or a map, like you mentioned. So, mm -hmm. um, so all of these things, though, they have a certain, they have certain principles that are guiding this, this kind of, this one thing. So that's kind of what I'm digging at. And uh, for, for folks that may think that they're not on their path or, uh, you know, there might be some avoidance of that or, or indecisiveness. I know, especially in some young people, it's hard because you want to be everything, you know, um, you, you feel that potential and you don't know where to point it. So just talk a little bit about that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, so the, the, the starting point is it, it, 
it's kind of like talking to someone about tracking and then basically saying you're a human being so you are a tracker i don't really care if you agree or not like you're also a thing that breathes oxygen you're a thing that makes tool like that's what humans are mm -hmm. um and we live in a physical universe and i don't care what you look at in the physical universe until you get to to some you know where it gets a little wonky with stuff like quantum physics and even then there's symmetry that seems to be coming out of stuff um you know paths are made and they are predictable given enough information um and given a certain perspective so when i see people say stuff like well i haven't found my path and you know there's the the seemingly cheeky answer to be like well just look down right like look look down you, that's so you, you there, there you go you're 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 on it it's right there well yeah but i mean it's not what i'm supposed to do i don't know what supposed to means not in not in terms of path i i don't i, I would like to know um if it were useful i don't think it is so i don't do a lot of trying to figure it out um you know shoulds and supposed tos that's conditioning most of the time and um so a lot of what people are running into when they're when they're struggling with even understanding that they're that they have a path um or pursuing a path or anything like that uh it, it's it's getting past some of the conditioning just realizing that that's not i don't want to say not real in the sense that it doesn't actually have a factor doesn't matter i mean not real in the sense that it's a construct that you can take apart and get rid of and and suffer no essentially ill consequences um so it's an artifice but humans make stuff we are artificial artifice comes artificial is what we do right um it's natural uh bees have artifice termites you know lots of other creatures create and transmogrify and 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 uh, adapt the environment to their to their what suits them and things like that we're not alone in that but it is a primary a primal aspect of our nature yeah, it is we, we, our we, main we, survival tool we call them artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> so what I think is useful is for people to to look at the art in their life. Right? Look at look at where they see art in their life. And then look at where they look at what they do and have done and see the art in that. And I think that's the part that take that it just takes a little bit of work for people to do that. They some people will struggle with that. I'm not an artist. Okay. I didn't say you were good. <laughs> right? I can't draw. Can you write? Yeah, you can draw. You draw words all the time. Like, well, but that's not the same. No, no, no. You're not great at it. Right? But you can do it. And there's a difference between drawing and being famous for it or being recognized as great at it. But that doesn't take away the value of drawing. In fact, other than for some artists, the monetary gain of painting or drawing or sculpting or, or what have you, um, or the, the gains of, of uh, popularity or, or um, esteem or anything like that, the actual doing of the thing, it's just as valuable for those accomplished people as it is for someone who you know, it's stick figures. It literally is just as valuable. The experience is 99% the same on a visceral level. Um, so it's difficult for people to see that. Um, it's difficult for people to remove the, the things from the pedestals that, you know, it's like, you know, drawing means you gotta be great. It's like, that's not what it means. So some of it is just reframing. And that's where um, 
it's so it's often a really good place like you know it's you you didn't just pick primal haphazardly it's an incredibly useful word to help people gain not just one perspective but varied perspectives around a subject um in useful and different ways repeatedly so so much of of understanding the path is to just fucking look just stand where you are and do a 360 and look up and look down just do that then the next thing is don't label it <laughs> that's the that's the next conditioning that people are usually going against the first is that, that that it's a thing that's not happening because they've created a vocabulary around it that creates a meaning that keeps them outside of it so the first step is look around and realize like you're in it if you if there were nothing to see or let's say you're blind if there's nothing to hear or let's say you're blind and deaf if there's nothing to feel like there is an experience mm. and if you're in an experience you're doing it <laughs> right yeah. it might not be what you wanted it to be or what you thought it was or what was sold to you but that's so much less important than just realizing you're doing it it's happening so then comes in the then you have to reframe and, and maybe pick words that fit better um but you have to get there by not labeling it first because you want to just really take stuff in. And if you need to make your own word for it, eventually you do that. Then the next thing is you try to make everyone else use the words you're using <laughs> because then you can understand each other. Right. Um, so it's about getting a similar vocabulary, but those things aren't necessary. They're not what I would call us. They're not primal. The primal is the stop and look around. The primal is to pay attention to what's going on without the labels. That's the primal. And then the artifice, which is also a primal skill, is the active creativity, the active change of vocabulary, the active um, measuring what's happening, making, drawing your maps of, your, of the territory you're covering, of your path, of what you think you see ahead of you. Um, and that's the choice part. It, it, it's it's not fancy it's not woohoo it doesn't i either and this is definitely a strong possibility i completely misunderstand what enlightenment means or it's nowhere near the problem solver everyone thinks it is i think it's the second one it's not a problem enlightenment does not solve a problem Enlightenment lets you adapt. Because um, enlightenment is just seeing the light. Well, what's seeing the light? It's, it, light is reflected off of things. You're seeing reflections of things. You're seeing reflections of yourself. And there are philosophies that focus there. You're seeing, um, you're seeing reflections off of dangers. Um, you know, things to be wary of. You're seeing reflections off of shiny objects that attract your attention. All of that is just, it's the scene. It's just the scene, just the experiencing. And anything other than that is, is great, but it's haphazard if it's not on purpose. And then that, I guess, would be when people are, what I think people think about when they think of a path, um, they think about the on purpose part. Um, when they think about enlightenment, they think about the on purpose part. And I would agree there. Um, that's the choice. That's the part that's the choice. And that's the part that gives agency. Um, for people who care about power, that's where that can be found. For people who care about surrender, that's where that can be found. For people who care about answers, that's where that can be found. For people who care about um, connection, that's where that can be found. Um, and I say where, not how. Right? Choice is an action, but it, it's a thing that creates a space for you, for your experience. 
So another way of putting that is I can only see in what humans call the visual spectrum of light. And we only mean our visual spectrum, right? But we, uh, we know that there is a broader wavelength of light and that it can be detected in other ways. Um, and my perspective, my limit there, it's useful, particularly because it's the only thing that I can reliably use. I can infer ultraviolet light exists because of behavior of bees and I can do experiments and realize that they can detect ultraviolet light and then through them I can do that. Or I can build a camera that can detect it um, through certain wavelengths and that gets turned into zeros and ones and then that gets gone through a program which then translates into my visual spectrum, something I can interpret and call that detecting ultraviolet light. But it's all of that is still only done through what I got. I can look through this, but I can move this. And that's the choice point. I don't have a choice about this. I do have a choice about where it focuses and what it can take in. Very cool. um, and that is what's going to affect what I think is real. Because that's all the brain's doing is just making you think that that's what's going on. Um, so that's why I make the distinction of choice is a tool, but it's a, but it's a, it's a being tool. It's not a doing tool, if that makes any sense. Totally, yeah. I think people really think it's the doing tool. I'm like, no, the doing is what you do with it. <laughs> right, right, right. It's, a, it's the flashlight of your focus in a way, and then you can see, right? Right. Um, you know, what, what you're mentioning, it, just using that visual analogy, is the bringing up uh, constraints because what we have is a limited, a limited uh, vehicle that we can participate in. And so we have these constraints, but um, which can be a limitation, but also you know, a big part of what we're looking at in, the, in our path training is, is the power of constraints. So, Well, it's um, not only it can be a limitation, it is a limitation. We have absolutely. limits. And they're talk, going back to the conditioning. There's a lot in our culture that says, push your limits, find your limits, exceed your limits. You exceed cannot your exceed your limits. You can't. They're limits. Yeah. That's what they fucking are. You can try to find them. You can. Um, usually it means you die. Um, when you're doing, in terms of the, like, the mentality of like push, push, push. Um, it forgets the fact that, you know, it's like saying the most important part of the orange is the very out, very, like, is the micron, is the, the atom layer of the outer part of the rind of the orange. That's what I hear when people are like, it's all about pushing your limits, finding your limits, exceeding your limits. I'm like, that's part, that's a thing. It's good to know what your limits are. Yes. But there's a lot of other stuff but inside of that sphere, right? There's more rind, there's the fruit, there's seeds, there's, there's how that ripens itself and then, you know, decomposes and like, it's just not that static. It's just not how anything it's works. Very, so, uh, very yeah, one-dimensional. So, so instead of because part of that whole find your limits is a rejection of what you think your limits are now. And I don't think that's the most useful. I think it's really useful to just go, what do I think my limits are right now? Cool. Those are my limits. Now, what can I make with those? Right? What can I do with my limits? I'm just going to agree that there are limits. Fine. Um, and people hear that. And I mean, there's probably people right now who are listening to this going like, ah, you know, uh, and they probably love stuff from like Jocko Wilnick, right? Who I also fucking love. He's great and shares a lot of really cool stuff. The funny thing is he absolutely is talking about the same thing I'm talking about. At least I think so. Um, in a lot of ways. And people like that. It, you can bristle if you want to, but if I hand you 
a piece of paper and a pencil and I say, draw the best representation you can of um, your favorite family member. And I don't mean their face or their body or anything like that. Just whatever you think is the best representation of them. It might be a symbol. It might just be shading. I don't know, but you'll recognize it, right? I've given you two very specific, I've given you the constraint of the paper, the pencil, and that sort of essential, you're trying to bring that out. Or I say, you can use every possible tool that a person has ever used to make a piece of, of art on a, on a flat surface. We'll just keep it to that, just that constraint. It can be paint, it can be pencil, it can be spit, it can, I don't care, whatever. <laughs> Which one do you think is going to actually br bring out more creativity? And which one is going to make you really get to like, okay, so how do I really do this? When you have all of those choices, when you have all of that opportunity, when there is no limit or almost no limit, um, your creativity sucks. And, and it's hard to even start. You know, if we're talking about a path, let's say you do start a path right now right? That it's not something you've been doing your whole life, but you're going to start on your path now. How the hell do you see your next step when you could literally go anywhere? Mm -hmm. It's overwhelming. But if you go, I don't know what my path is for sure, but I know it goes to the, you know, I know it's to the right of where I am right now. Then you just turn to the right and you take one step or you turn to the right and you look at the ground and you look at where you can put your foot. That is freedom. That is expression. That is creativity. You're adapting to what is around you. That's human. That's what we do. So it's not wrong to want to push or, or, or view limits as bad or, or something to be avoided. But it is really limiting <laughs> in all the ways you don't want limits. Like that's, that's, a, that's a limit you don't, that doesn't serve very well. Um, embracing the constraints that you have or even just the ones you, you, that have been, that you've agreed to and have been thrust upon you or you've made up for yourself through your own survival habits or whatever. Just start there. That's great. That's where you get to create. You can make anything, you can make anything out of having a first step. You can't make anything out of having nowhere to go. Totally, man. Hey, that sounds like a t-shirt or something. <laughs> Get on that. <laughs> Damn. Now, you know, going back to your story of uh, when you started dabbling in martial arts, you know, probably without that dabbling or without the first step of tracker or whatever, you never would have found Guru Dan. You know what I mean? You wouldn't have found the legitimate path that you really are embracing here's, right now. Here's the funny thing. If I had not gone to college or let's say, okay, let's say I'd done all, everything in college and I'd done the acrobatics and, and I'd had that background and I had a little bit of tracker. Um, I had my own dirt time and stuff like that. But I, I went to LA and became a stunt, a stunt man right after college. Let's say I did that. I definitely would have, I mean, part of the plan was go to the Inosano Academy. That was it for sure because the number of amazing stunt people that i knew about they uh, so many of them came out of there that it was a definite i'm going there right i would have nowhere near the appreciation i have now nowhere near the ability to be the student of guru dan and people like him or anybody if i hadn't done the other things that i did just wouldn't happen um, I don't know what it would be. I am confident I would have made it something useful to myself, but I really like how I got where I got. I like having the ability to have some insight and training and the ability to sh share totally different perspective with people and have them get value from it and have their different perspective impact me. Um, and I absolutely would never have had that if I had, if I had done what I wanted to do, if I had followed that path and never given up, wouldn't happen, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
That's really cool. Hey, another thing that you reminded me of um, when you were talking about uh, <clears throat> it may, uh, a path is something that makes you see a certain way or a choice is make, something that makes you see a certain way. Um, the idea of, you know, when you make a choice, you basically create a world. It's not just that you see a different way. Well, I guess you are. You're, you're detecting aspects of everything. You know, you're, you're pulling the pieces out of the great mystery <laughs> that are relevant to the choice, right? And so in that way, we create a world it seems, you know, mm -hmm. we're living in a certain space, right? So, and we, we talk about that often as the power of context, you know? Yeah. Um, so talk about that a little bit, a little bit more. Like what, explain, uh, or just talk about context. What does that mean to you? Well, context, context it's, they, the context are the limits, right? The context are the, are the constraints. Um, context, really matters. You know, if we're going to talk about humans are meaning making machines, right? Something mattering. If humans weren't around, that wouldn't exist. Right? We make things matter. Um, and we need that. And social animals need things to matter. We're not the only ones, but it, most social animals make things matter, right? Um, and I'm, what I mean is beyond just a need. So you have the need to eat, you have the need to breathe, you have the need to drink water. But then we have these other needs of like, something has to be valuable, create value. So context is how we find that and, um, and how we make things matter. And so in that sense, context is the thing that matters. So we have the driving force, the need or desire or want or direction from a guide or, or, or mentor or something like that, um, or something we're shying away from. That's, that's huge. But so there, we have a motivation and then there's the context. So take the motivation, you go into the context. And if you don't pay attention to the context, if you don't see how it matters to your motivation, whatever you get on the other side of that is going to be more or less useful or effective. So, in our culture, there's a big push for like optimal and best and the right way. Um, and that's fine, but in what context? Optimal for what? You know, uh, people look to professional athletes and how they train and go, well, that, if I can do that, that's optimal physical performance. Okay. Um, professional being a professional athlete is bad for you. It's psychologically very taxing. It does not put you in a great place a lot of the time for social interaction when the sport's done. The sport's gonna be done. You're not gonna be able to keep doing it. You know why? You busted yourself up doing it. So peak performance when? Right? Is it it might be peak performance for a 25 year old. It is not peak, but if you keep doing exactly that, you're not gonna be able to do even close to that at 70. Now, maybe you don't care, fine. But if the idea of being able to walk up and down stairs at 70 years old matters to you, don't train like a professional athlete. <laughs> <laughs> the context matters. It's gonna define things. Um, you know, to use martial art, uh, you know, people uh, will poo-poo certain, certain arts, right? Um, uh, a lot of people don't think of Aikido necessarily as being all that effective, right? It's not effective. Like, well, it's certainly difficult to use effectively with only a couple of years experience. In fact, it's probably difficult to use effectively with under 12 to 15 years experience depending on how else you're training. Um, but it's probably something you can train your whole life and it's going to become more and more applicable as you get better and better at it. And it's going to seem like magic to people who are, look, just punch, kick, knee, elbow, headbutt, solve the problem, boom, done. Both are correct in a certain context. 
And what if you happen to be in a context where, hey, you're great at Muay Thai. In fact, you're amazing. In fact, your light kicks break legs, right? Your elbows just tear gashes and, and dense skulls. But that's what you know how to do. And your grandmother has dementia and picks up a knife uh, or, or a rolling pin, right? And is coming at you. How's your Muay Thai? Is that what you want in that context? Or maybe just a little bit of understanding what Aikido is using could be useful. Yeah. They're both right. It's context. So when you're looking for right and wrong, when you're looking for better and best, when you're looking for more or less, you gotta, if you're not understanding the context, you really can't get anything out of that, out of the idea of more or better or worse or any of that. You just can't. So that's where I think that's, it, context is the constraints that you get to create it. So it's really important to, that's why awareness is such a big thing. It's why awareness is such a, it's a primal skill. Um, because the drive is always going to be there. You're alive. So there's going to be a drive there. So then the next skill set is the awareness because that's what lets you read the context. And that's, and then from that you get the creativity and that's, that's where the, the artifice and the, the, the cool stuff that we make up comes out of. Right. Yeah. And it's, there's an interesting kind of feedback cycle there in the way that you're talking about context. Cause in a lot of ways we are, you know, we talk about it like you put on your superhero costume, you know, mm -hmm. you're creating a story or a context that you're living within. It's like, I'm going to be, you know, a martial artist. And so your life takes on a certain form because if you don't do certain things, you're not, you're basically not a martial artist, you know? Right. Um, so it's interesting how that kind of feeds into creating the context, which then makes you look for certain things in your world and, you know, Kind of that's that's another thing. You know, that's that comes back to that intentionality of stuff where where um you know it's like you're co-creating your path. Well yeah, like so you know, Marple touched on this a little bit when he was talking about tracking. Um and I would just sort of go just sort of a, a little further with it in that um one of the thing the the thing about tracking is it gets you to a place an understanding, a perspective, um, and awareness, uh, where what you think of as yourself dissolves. And for a while, that's how it is, right? So the sense of self dissolves and you're still doing a thing. You're still following sign or, or, or what, what have you, you're still tracking, but there's action, there's beingness, but there isn't a self. From there becomes a, uh, and I've, I haven't had this in any sustained period of time, but I do, I've had it long enough that I know it's a thing. Um, self starts to be everything. So there is that separation. And he was talking about the, the, uh, the person he didn't want to mention talking about the, the, there's the track, there's you, what's in between nothing so anything that's between you and the track you put there um yeah was it you, you by the way <laughs> it might have been me that might have been me. um i really appreciated that he that he, he I, I thought i laughed it was fun <laughs> so, you, so you were the one who put the thing between him and the earth <laughs> right <laughs> so but what what ends up happening is, is there still ends up being a track and a you, right? And then eventually there's no you. And then there's, then eventually what you are is the, the whole thing. It's the you, it's the track, it's the path, it's the trail, it's the need, it's the other people, it's the other animal. It, it, um, and that's that thing that people refer to as oneness, I think. I think that's my experience and that's it seems to match what people talk about when they talk about that um and it's not a feeling 
it's just a shift. It's a dramatic shift in perspective. So the cool thing is you can do that on purpose, right? A choice is, a, you could call a choice a, a, a lens, right? And I've got, maybe I've got glasses that are a frame and I've got 15 lenses that can all kind of spin out on this side and then I've got, you know, 12 on this side and I can do different combinations of those lenses and each lens is a choice. And that's what will change how I'm taking in that thing that isn't self yet, right? That other, that outside, the context. But eventually you realize you're the context too, right? It, right. It, it's, it's the part that people like to, to grandiosely or just probably wrongly um, tie in quantum physics with in terms of certain spiritual practices where they're like, you know, the observe, you know, consciousness is all and you're the observer which is the observed and and, and so be, by observing you are changing the universe it's like yeah not the way you think it's really <laughs> just much more basic than that it's not right. metaphysical it's not fancy pants um you know i had a friend that was super into the secret super dupe like at least six years of just really working what what she learned in the secret and it wasn't something I was like trying to dissuade her from or anything like that. But when she first got into it, I was like, you do understand that all this is, is you're just learning to key your awareness to notice stuff that fits with what you want to do. You're just putting on a certain pair of glasses. You're making certain choices and that's going to, you're giving yourself a limitation. That's going to key your awareness to certain things. You have an intention then you have attention and then you can make different choices. And she's like, no, it's way more than that. Six years go by, we're having another conversation. I was like, so remember back with the thing? I'm not doing it I told you so, but you're walking away from this thing that has been a huge part of your life for six years. Are you keeping the part about your keen, your awareness? And it, she was like, yes, that you're, yes, that's all it's ever been. And I know that now. I was like, great. That's awesome. You got the essential tool. Like, that, great. That was the secret right there. Yeah. It's like, there you go. Like, and, and she was kind of kicking. The reason it came up is because she was sort of kicking herself for, I've spent all this time doing all this stuff. I was like, you spent all that time getting really good at training your awareness. It's great. You didn't even know that's exactly what you were doing, but you got the time and reps. You have a new set of constraints. You have a new skill set. You can use it. Go ahead. So. Don't throw it away. That's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good example of kind of utilizing your past or especially if you don't know your own, you know, if you don't not aware of your path or haven't thought of it as your path, um, it can be kind of daunting as a, you know, when you're a little older to start something and think, man, if only I'd started when I was five years old. It's like, well, you did. And that's how you got where, where you are. <laughs> you, you, you can't be you here. You did without start when having, you were five years old and you got here at this point. Yeah. But uh, but also like reframing, like you're talking about with your friend, like there's there's value in what you've done, unless you just, I suppose, completely ignored the whole thing. Right. <laughs> you can you can harvest some of that um, that dirt time that. And something. and I'm not talking about you know just always finding the silver lining or 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 Pollyannaing or or the opposite of that, doing the sour grapes thing. I'm, that's not what I'm getting at. There has to be an honesty with yourself about it, but you can look back on things you've done and be like, oh, that was a waste, or you can repurpose the parts of it that are useful. There you go. You know, um, it's, it, I was already, you know, I, I, the language I used, I already talked about like, yeah, well, I learned a whole lot of, you know, what not to do. I've also learned that, a, a slightly more useful way of putting that is I learned how to do something differently than I would, than, than most would suspect, right? It's not, don't hit your head on the, on the beam because the door is lower. You idiot. You don't look back and go like, Oh, and that's where I hit my head on the beam. Okay. So in future, don't hit my head on the beam. Or when you see a beam like that duck, it's different. Yeah. But don't hit your head on the beam. 
means at the very most, you probably don't end up hitting your head on the beam anymore. But every time you need to duck because there's a thing right here, you didn't learn that. You learned don't hit your head on the beam. But yeah. when something's here, duck, that has a lot more utility. That'll show up a lot more often. Neither one yeah. is better or worse, but one is more often useful. That's all. And I'm lazy. I'm very lazy. <laughs> it's, I say that and people are like, but Harley, all this other stuff you do and how, you know, like you do that and you accomplish that and you train this. And I was like, uh huh. And when I'm not doing that, I'm sitting on my ass watching TV. <laughs> like, and <laughs> like, I have friends who exercise, right? They exercise. And when I could train more often and things like that, they were like, well, you exercise more than I do. I was like, no, I don't. What I'm doing is not exercise. I'm doing martial art and I'm playing and having fun. I happen to be getting some cardiovascular benefit and some strength conditioning going on. But I'm not exercising. You're exercising. I hate exercise. <laughs> I don't do it. It bugs the shit out of me. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I don't use, uh, you know, I won't use weights or something like that. But it has to be in a framework that, that is going to work for me. So work for its own sake. Hell no. Nope. So yeah. when I can find tools that are versatile and apply to lots of contexts, you better believe those are the ones I want. Those are what I've stayed. I'm like, yep, keep, put that in the toolkit. Because also I don't want that many tools. You got to, that tool bag gets heavy. You right. got to carry around heavy tools. Yeah. What's the universal toolkit? Yeah. yeah. Good old crescent wrench and... <laughs> You know, I, I, I built this van and I was going over with, with my uh, brother-in-law who is a great builder and, and uh, just getting some advice. I was like, all right, so what do I, what do I need in my tool bag, literally, that will handle the majority of problems that I'm going to come up with on this van? And I, you know, laid out, I think it was like eight different things. He's like, no, those two, that thing can do, that thing can do that too. Just, you have to use it different that and that, like, and he got me down to, to five. And I think I had like 10 or eight or something like that to start with, but not only five, but like two of them, I didn't know I could do other things with <laughs> very easily. And he's like, Hey, just do it. Like, I was like, Oh, great. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And if there's that said, if there's a point where I'm like, I really need the tool that's very specifically designed for that thing. Fine. Then you go get that tool. You go find it. Right. But you don't need to be carrying it around all the time. So, well, so much of what all of this is, is, is what you have to look at, the context, and how you look at it, which is also the context. You know, when, when Marple was talking about there's that external tracking and then there's the internal tracking. I don't agree that those two phrases mean anything. But, um, but I know why they're used because they're a great bridge to get to the point where you understand like it's just fucking track it's fine <laughs> um, but it's that point the, there's the context of of what you are being pulled by and pulling to you that's the train right and then there's the context of the you that it's going through and and passing through mm -hmm. um, and there's that understanding as well of like it, it's it's fleeting None of this stuff is permanent. It's always moving through you. So I, I laugh at myself constantly when I'm like, oh, guess I get to learn that again. Because how many times have we learned a lesson and really had it hammered home and we're like, wow, okay, I understand now. I get it. And then cut to some very different context, probably years down the line, and you're like, well, I was wrong. I did not learn that lesson because <laughs> if I had, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> um, it's because it's just, it's moving through and, and lessons don't have to stick. Experiences don't have to stick. In fact, they probably don't. In fact, if they do, you're probably just, the only thing that's sticking is something you made, a, 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 a facsimile of what actually happened, which is great, but I don't know, let it go bang your head again like oh i thought i learned not to bang my head i'm like no you learned not to bang your head on the door <laughs> you didn't learn to die 
<laughs> you didn't learn to duck. It's like, you did learn to not bang your head. You didn't learn to duck. Those are different things, you know? Um, and the other thing, the reason I think that that's important is it lets you laugh. It lets you enjoy failure, mistakes, um, not knowing things, not being satisfied by outcomes, because those are all guarantees. So if you can't, if you can't navigate those, I'm sorry, that sucks. That just sucks. Hmm. Um, so what do you, what do you think, is there anything that we've severely missed about this subject that would be useful for people? What do people um, usually need to get about the path? I think a big thing about the path is people think of it as, you know, there's, there's that it's the journey, not the destination, which again, essentially it's a very useful map. It's a very useful framing. Um, destinations are cool too, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> but but the but the essence of what that is is the path the focus on the path is that that is not a focus on a destination that is a focus on where you are um the past what you have walked the path that does exist is a little bit a part of that but it's not the same as where you're standing at the moment um and the vision, right? Your heading, your vision, your your goal or your your purpose. It's so different for a lot, so many different people, but if we're going to keep it in a visual context, we'll call it vision. Um, that's still not a destination, right? The path is the primal. It's the essential. Vision is a support to me for, for the path. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't have my path. I need a vision. I need, I need to find my vision. Then I'll, then I'll be able to know my path. It, vision is useful for the people who feel lost because it gets them moving. It gets them at least somewhat paying attention to where they already are. But the, the I'll go ahead and call it a mistake. Um, the mistake is to think that the path is about going somewhere. The path is about the going. It's the, it, the path is the action and the evidence of the action. It's what could be measured previously and what you can tell about what's happening now. It is not about where it ends up or where it's even going. Um, and the reason I say that is like, let's say you could look over someone's entire life. Maybe you could look over your, your own entire life and you could see, exactly where it ended exactly you were given you know god came down and flicked you on the nose and said boom vision fully realized this here's exactly what it looks like here's exactly where it's going to be you'll be this old it'll look like this you'll have these people around you all of that that would tell you nothing about how you got there <laughs> that's right zero things and if you focused on that you'd get lost a lot a lot because you'd keep finding you keep going like but that kind of looks like what that looked like that i thought i saw at the end so i i mean i should i guess i'll go there now and it's like well but wait are you thirsty right now yeah There's, you can see the lake it's right there you can see the water yeah but over there is what well that's the rocky cliff that that i sort of see in you know with vision cool do the rocks Give you water? Ever drink a what? Do you drink a rock often? No. Do you see waterfall? No. But you do see water. Yeah. And you're thirsty right now. Yeah. Go to the fucking water, stupid! Like, it's, it, and it's not wrong if you do go to the rocky outcropping or whatever. It's just being going to be that like you're going to get thirsty enough that you leave that and go to the water because you. So the grandiosity of destination the grandiosity of vision the grandiosity of spiritual of what of making path to be this big thing it's like it can't, how is it a big thing if everyone has it right. you're on it you're doing it if you want it to be big you can make that cool you know if it's important to you that you skip down the path cool get good at skipping if it's important to you that that your path has 
flaming hoops that you dive and do backflips through, great, and put the flaming hoops there and, and do that. But that's just remember, you're, that's you. You're doing that because it matters to you. But that's the only, I mean, you don't have to. That's awesome. You know, uh, yeah, sounds like sounds like a good place to kind of wrap it up. But do you have any other final comments on Path that you want to leave with us? Um, yeah, do it. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so often, I know it's, it's, I, I'm really annoying this way, and, and it's, it's great that I have people like you that I teach with and, and, uh, and friends that, you know, our paths are often intertwining and nearby each other so we can see each other. Um, you're doing it anyway. You're going to be doing it anyway. You can resist it. You can... You can really put a ton of effort and energy into it but at the end of the day seriously like just just actively do it to whatever degree you can and i know that seems like not enough especially to those push the limits people but whatever degree you can if you really understand your limits right now even if they're self-imposed is always going to be something else the more you do it so if you're sitting there going, I'm struggling, I don't know where my path is, or you're sitting there going, I absolutely know what my path is, 100%, and, and I've been you know, doing it, da, da, da. the only thing I would say is like, cool, choose again. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where my path is. Great, take a step. Yeah, but I'm not on my path. Cool, take a step. Yeah, but I'm, I still don't know where my path is. Great, take a step. Or I absolutely do, and I'm doing it. Like, cool. You've been marching in a straight line? Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you just, instead of, instead of stepping there, why don't you just see what happens. Just, just take that step. Or take, or take the step as if you haven't taken it before. Because you haven't taken that step before. Right. That, that's such a crucial thing, is let the new, again, going back to Guru Dan, guy is the best student I've witnessed. Um, Tom probably is also on par in terms of his being a student kind of thing, but I don't get to see it. He hides right. it a lot. Guru just puts it out there. Um, so that's why I say he's the, the best student I've seen because he's just literally always learning. It doesn't matter how many times he's seen that move or heard that idea or whatever. He's still going, okay, what about that? Don't I know? What about that am I missing? What about that do they do that I don't do? And not, not in a they're better, I'm better, they're worse. Just, uh, I'll end here. There's a, a sci-fi book series um, by an author named Dan Simmons. Um, and I just call it the Hyperion series, but I don't know what it's, it's four books. Um, and in it, there's basically a Messiah character, um, except she knows. So from birth, she's known that she's going to be, at a certain point, this sort of messenger from the universe to humanity. Okay. And she has all these cool experiences and does all this stuff and all this other drama goes on with all these other characters that are important for her to be in the place where she needs to be for the thing to happen because that's how books work and not how life works except it kind of is. And she finally gets her thing. What's her message going to be? And she boils it all down and she's like, choose again. That's, that's the, the, the big epiphany. Choose again. And of course, automatically people are like, oh, you mean if you have chosen the thing, then choose something different. She's like, that, sure. Oh, you mean if you have done the thing, then do it. Choose to do it again. Sure. What I get from that, I mean, it's, it's a fiction book written by a totally normal human author. It's a wonderful insight into human nature in the idea of whatever, you're, whatever you think you're doing, 
choose it, and then choose again. Whatever that means. It might mean choose it again, but, it, but by doing that choose again, it's like, it's, it, choose again is another way of saying ask the sacred question. Like, okay, I did that. Now I'm gonna do that, but it's not that again. Or I'm gonna do something different, but I was already doing something different. Again, like, it's, it's really useful. It's yeah, really definitely. useful. That's so powerful. The, uh, something about those choice points and they do come up, you know, they, they, it can be kind of predictable. There are cycles and things after all, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we can identify those choice points, it gets a little easier to choose. I love that. It feels like the structure in a way of the path. It's the steps, you know? Yeah. It's wonderful to be pulled. Just, I caution people to, if your goal is to climb Everest and summit Everest, that's a great goal. If that's the thing you're into, right? Just don't forget that there's a lot of you along the way. Right. A lot. Mo tons of dead bodies that didn't succeed. So there's that. <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe you learn that lesson, but, um, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah, the summit's great, but so is everything else along the way. Like, check it out. Um, be pulled, move fast, but pay, you know, just, just take it all in. Enjoy the journey. Yeah. And, and when you're sitting there saying, I don't know what to do when you're sitting there, you know, when you know, life is fucking stressful for a lot of people right now and they don't know what things are gonna look like don't worry about that right now you can that worry can be there in 10 minutes right now just look around at what is going on just what is what is your path right now what do you see what do you feel what do you hear and without the labels of what that means just if the more often you can do that it just is psychologically, physiologically, which is psychologically, uh, which is both, um, in terms of dealing with other people, problem solving, all that, it just makes it all so much easier. Take it from a lazy, lazy person. Wow, does that make things easy. <laughs> um, well, dude, so cool thank you so much this is really uh i think this you know especially right now i'm not trying to lock this in time with what we're going through with the pandemic but really valuable for folks i think so i really appreciate your perspective because it's always unique i don't want to say contrary but it is from a different <laughs> place very often so one of the things i really value man it's only contrary if you look at it from the other side that's right <laughs> So, so, ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, uh, if people want to find out more about Harley and what you're up to, is there anything you want to mention um, right now? What's going on for you or coming up or? A whole lot of nothing right now. And, and, uh, you know, with, with what I have to offer that people have decided they'll pay me for, um, it's going to be a while before that's a thing I can do uh, in the way I've been doing it. So right now I'm, I'm shifting how that could be. Um, if people are interested, uh, I have a website called Fractal Martial Art. Um, www.fractalmartialart.com, not martial arts. There's no S. Uh, so you can find out a little bit about what I have to do martial art, what I have to offer martial art wise there. Uh, I'm working on another thing that is kind of similar to, to what you are doing with Hero Lab, but different and probably complementary. And we'll, I'm hoping those will actually end up doing a lot of cross pollinating. Um, but that's not a, it's not a thing yet. So I don't want to throw it out there too much, but uh, distance learning stuff from me is coming. Awesome. I don't know. When. <laughs> right. I never do. <laughs> yeah, I know absolutely. when it, I know when when it's like about to happen. 
yeah. and that's not right. So you still do uh, consulting and coaching and stuff. It's actually been a while. I, I mean, no one's reached out for quite a while, but I did for a while do some, some, can I say a while a few more times? Like for a while, I'll say that. Uh, I, I have done some consulting with people uh, who are, it's apparently I'm, I've been useful for folks who are working with groups, um, particularly if they're doing um, education based stuff. So whether it be wilderness education or a classroom or something like that. Um, and I seem to have something to offer in terms of how to professionally engage with the people you work with, how to professionally engage with your clientele, um, how to, and particularly in the area of setting and sticking to limitations and creating constraints that are useful to you and, and finding the value in those because it's very easy to want to please everyone all the time and, and you can't. And I'm really good at not doing that. So. <laughs> oh, that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> You're so good. At, I'm, I'm actually very, I've learned a lot from you on that. The, uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm pretty content with, oh, you don't like me. Okay. <laughs> There's good reasons for that. I agree with you. You shouldn't like me if that's a thing you care about but you're so likable it's such a paradox i don't know well cool man. I, i'm a lovable asshole what can i say <laughs> and i'm completely full of shit so and uh, i'll end there absolutely take anything i say with a grain of salt i have never had an original idea i'm only drawing from different places i've been lucky enough to have a lot of different places to draw from um and to to put some time and effort into finding ways that those things go together but None of this is, is my idea, and, and I just hope it's useful for you. Um, and if you find ways that, that work better for you or work better for more people, do that. And please let me know so I can copy. It'd be great. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. And thank thanks you for so watching. Everyone. My absolute pleasure.